When he got born again, his life totally, absolutely changed. And one of the things he said everywhere he went was glory, glory, glory. He said, matter of fact, he said, when I walk, he said, one step says glory and the other says amen. He said, I can't stop it. Glory, amen, glory, amen. And I'm just thinking, matter of fact, he was called an eccentric preacher, but uh, had a wonderful testimony. When he was dying, guess what his last word was just before he died? Glory. <laughs> And he was ready to go. When his wife was dying, he said, glory to God, she's going to heaven. So anyway, I, I don't know why that came to my mind. I like that song, glory to God. Amen. Well, I'm glad you're here, and I'm glad anybody's here on a holiday weekend, especially on our way here, coming down 50 from over near Sneeds Ferry, or Sneeds Ferry is where we live. So coming down Sneeds Ferry, coming down 50, coming 53, is it, to cut across from Jacksonville? I think we passed the whole world going the opposite direction to uh, maybe Top Sail Beach or Surf City, wherever. But I mean, I've never seen so many cars going that direction since we've been coming over here. But uh, we're glad you're here. And uh, oh, I am so sorry. Yes. So let me introduce it anyway. Yes. So today is Memorial Day weekend. And, uh, and, and the day that we have set aside in this country to honor and remember our fallen soldiers who gave their lives so that you and I could be free. So we have a video to kick that off. To the brave men and women who stood up for freedom, who answered the call and fought for our nation, who paid the ultimate price and never came back. To the American soldier, we thank you. To the mothers and fathers who raised a hero. To the brothers and sisters with an empty space. To the sons and daughters who have only memories to the wives and husbands who bear the void with pride, to all who've lost a soldier they love, no gift could repay your sacrifice, no tribute could match our admiration, no word can contain our gratitude, but still it deserves to be said, we remember you, we salute you, and we honor you today. Thank you, Brother Mark, for that video. We're going to ask the children to come up here before they get dismissed. I'm going to maybe try to move this off to the side so I have a place to sit for a minute. And uh, y'all come on up here, and I'm going to try to do a little bit of my introduction to my message. Hey, Carolyn, man, I always need to save a place for you, don't I? Yeah. Why does she always choose that spot? <laughs> she wants to sit next to her pastor. <laughs> she wonder why she always chooses that spot. Oh, that's nice. Her little sister says she always says that you are her favorite. So I, I love being your favorite. Thank you so much. All right. Hey, tomorrow is a special day. It's called Memorial Day. So I have a question. You know what a memorial is? Okay, so memorial, okay. He said somebody served in the war, Claire. Somebody who, who served in the military who is now dead. Somebody, so Memorial Day is the day that we recognize those who served in the military and they got killed while they were serving our country. So that's what the day is for. Memorial, though, actually is something that's set aside to help us remember. 
Okay? Now, for instance, in the Bible, there's some memorials or something that helps us remember. One time, God had to destroy the earth with a flood. Remember who built the ark? No, no that's right. And when he got out of the ark, God did something to tell him and remind him that he would never again destroy the earth with a flood. What did he give him? Oh, you guys are good. He gave a rainbow. So every time you see a rainbow, it's kind of a memorial. Okay? It's a reminder. God has made a promise. He'll never destroy the earth with a flood. Okay? Now, today we're going to be talking about Joshua crossing the Jordan River with the people of Israel. And it was miraculous because they had the Ark of the Covenant and the priests were carrying it. And when they stepped into the water, guess what happened? And the Jordan River could have been, they tell us it was flood season. It could have been a mile wide. And there were two to three million Israelites that had to cross that river. I mean, and it was a mile wide. And how were they going to get across? They didn't have boats. They didn't have a bridge. But God had a plan. It was miraculous. So the priest had the Ark of the Covenant. And when they stepped Stepped down to the water. Guess what happened? The water went this way. The rest of the water flowed on down the river. And then the water on this side coming down started piling up. And every step they took, the water just kept going upriver and piled up. And then the ground in front of them was immediately dry. And I've been down the Jordan River. I've been in the Jordan River actually many times. And it is very muddy in that area where the Jordan River is. And... They finally walked across on dry land with the Ark of the Covenant standing in the middle of the river. And when they got to the other side, God told Joshua, now I want you to do something. Because that was a miracle. I mean, can you imagine? They stepped out, the water went up and it just piled up, piled up, piled up. It dried out. They walked across on dry land. That's a miracle. God did a great thing. And, of course, everybody in Canaan is getting scared to death. Oh, man, what kind of God do these Israelites have? And they're getting a little nervous about that. But anyway, so God told Joshua, now I want you to take a man from each tribe and go back down into the river and pick up 12 big stones and I know they were big because they had to put them on their shoulder and carry it out and put them in a big pile. So there were 12 stones piled up on the west side of the Jordan River. And you know why he did that? He said, because when you come back this way with your children for generations to come and they see this pile of stones, they're going to say, what are these pile of stones? And you tell them, this is what this pile of stones is about we cross that Jordan River on dry land. God, your God is a great God, and he does miracles for you. Now, you know what? We have a memorial right here behind me. Anybody can look far as you can look in this room behind me. The cross. The cross, the cross of Jesus Christ is a memorial. And every time we see the cross, it's a reminder that Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. He's the reason for our salvation. And I'm going to be talking to your moms and dads about that in a little bit. But today, tomorrow's Memorial Day, where we remember the soldiers that died. On Sundays, we're always, in every day, we should remember Jesus who died for us. But on Memorial Day, once a year, our freedom costs somebody their lives. Amen? And so we need to be thankful for that and remember them. And so that's what Memorial Day, it's a day... So it can be a day that reminds you, okay, of something. Or it can be a cross, or it can be a rainbow, or it can be a bunch of stones. But something that reminds you. And in your lives, listen, one more thing, you might want to set up some memorials, okay? Just think, might write it in a diary, diary or something that reminds you of God's goodness to you all through your life, okay? Well, God bless you all, and I hope you celebrate not memorial day but you celebrate jesus every day and remember the cost of freedom that some people paid so that we could live in america and be free amen good we need to be patriotic americans all right god bless you all you're awesome y'all have a good time in your sunday school time so you have a question emily oh yeah we had two birthdays today in here, uh, let's see, uh, Alex had a birthday yesterday. Coulson had a birthday today. And Annabelle has a birthday Friday, had a birthday Friday. 
Sue Curran had a birthday today. So we had a bunch of birthdays. If you see these folks, am I missing anybody? It seems like there's one more birthday that I'm missing. But anyway, if you see, <laughs> a birthday is a special day. You know what a, they tell us? Not Your birthday is not your favorite date. Maybe it is in all the world, but you get a lot of presents. Maybe it's a really special day for you. But uh, they, they tell us a person's favorite word. Do you know what it is? Their name. <laughs> they like to hear their name. My wife says she doesn't like to hear her name. Let me tell you what her full name was before I married her. <laughs> okay, what I, before I get in trouble, before I, before I get in trouble. Okay, let me put back these beautiful flags. Thank you for the decorations this morning. And I forgot to put on my coat, but that's all right. So, well, anyway, this, we have two more Sundays that will actually, after this Sunday, that will be your interim pastor. And uh, June the 12th will be our last Sunday as your interim pastor. It's going to be a special day. And uh, hopefully I'll be able to say some things that we were talking about in Sunday school to prepare you for your new pastor who's coming that we're very excited about. Our new pastor, I should say, because I'm a member of this church. And uh, it, that we're excited about. And, uh, and also we're going to, if it, everything works out and Luke continues to do okay, because you invested so much time and energy and prayers in the fact that he survived being born at a pound and a half and two years old, this actually next month, uh, we're going to actually have a dedication service here, and a lot of my family members will be here for that. So if you never met little Luke, you'll get a meeting and a special, special miracle baby. And again, we thank you. And these past two years that uh, we've been here have been just super fantastically special to my wife and I. And you just met a really need in our lives in a transitional time after pastoring for almost 50 years. We were connected to a lot of people. And it was really difficult to be away from everybody. Even our family moved down this way to give the new pastor a chance to get associated with the church there without an old pastor standing over his shoulder. And we like to give new pastors that kind of room as they take the reins and, and lead the church into the future. So we're glad you're here today, and we want to speak today about 12 memorial stones. Now, we started going through the book of Joshua, and actually, I had prepared a message on Joshua chapter 3 for today, okay? And, uh, and, and yet, the Lord, just last minute, put it on my heart to change it to Joshua chapter 4, so maybe we'll go back to the message I previously prepared for today and preach it next Sunday. We'll see what the Lord leads us to do. But we're going to talk about 12 memorial stones, okay? So if you're able and can stand with us, let's stand together for the reading of God's Word. Joshua chapter 4. Joshua chapter 4. When all the nation had finished passing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua. So y'all kind of already heard now the story behind this, so it'll be easier for you to listen to. Take 12 men from the people, from each tribe a man, and command them, saying, Take 12 stones from here out of the midst of the Jordan, from the very place where the priest's feet stood firmly, and bring them over with you and lay them down in the place where you lodge tonight. Then Joshua called the twelve men from the people of Israel whom he had appointed, a man from each tribe. And Joshua said to them, Pass on before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, and take up each of you a stone upon his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel, that this may be a sign of among you, or a memorial. When your children ask in time to come, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it passed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall be to the people of Israel a memorial forever. And the people of Israel did as Joshua commanded and took up 12 stones out of the midst of the Jordan, according to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel, just as the Lord had told Joshua. And they carried them over with them to the place where they lodged and laid them down there. 
And Joshua set up the twelve stones in the midst of the Jordan, in the place where the feet of the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant had stood. Where the feet of the priest, my mind was thinking more than I was reading. Where the feet of the priest bearing the Ark of the Covenant had stood, and they are there to this day. For the priest bearing the Ark stood in the midst of the Jordan until everything was finished that the Lord commanded Joshua to tell the people according to all that, command, that Moses had commanded Joshua, the people passed over in haste. Now, Father, I do pray that in these next moments that you'll help us to realize we all need some memorials in our lives to help us remember lest we forget. We're so prone to forget. I know I sure am. And Lord, I pray that you'll use this to encourage your people here at this wonderful church body of believers to remember the memorials that this church has over these last number of years as a church serving in this community. But Lord, to realize you're going to give us more opportunities to see you do mighty works in our midst because of what we have experienced in our past. So Lord, again, bless this day for your glory. Again, we pray for all those who've lost loved ones to battle, Lord, in war, who served in our country, Lord, and for our country. And we just pray blessings upon these many, many, many families, even today. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. And you can be seated. And, you know, I meant to ask this earlier, and I got, I got sidetracked with glory, glory, glory. And that was, if you're here today, and you had someone in your family that was killed, maybe Vietnam, killed in uh, a war or in conflict, Afghanistan, the Gulf War. Uh, you had a family member. Would you just lift your hand? I just would like to take a moment to, to recognize. So we have uh, Bonnie back here and uh, some people right across here, right over here. Okay, well, God bless you, and our hearts go out to you. But let me ask, how many of you might be here, you, not only family members, you have maybe friends or know of someone in your community that you were close to their family. So family, uh, friends, or extended people that you know that gave their life serving in our country could uh, during, during time of war, would you lift your hands? And I know there's probably a whole lot of us that have, that, that, that's, that's our case. And we should always be grateful and thankful because if we forget, you know, freedom for us might seem to be free, but it's really not free. Amen. It costs and it costs some people the sacrifice of their lives. And we always need to remember that. So this weekend is a special day and a day has been set aside just to remember these people. But today, when many people think of Memorial Day, what do they think of? It's the first day of what we might call the summer, yeah, you got it, the summer vacation, summer vacation, barbecues, backyard parties, family get-togethers, and, and for so many people, that's that. And uh, uh, in most churches, Memorial Day is ignored because it's not a holy day on the church calendar. But I think it's good for us to consider what Memorial Day really represents for its very name calls us to remember. Matter of fact, when you think about the ability to remember, is a wonderful, awesome gift that God has given us. In a flash, <laughs> we can be a child again, skipping a rock across the pond or walking in a meadow. Met a meadow. Th through memory, we can fall in love, get married, and enjoy our children all over again. And all this is through the blessing of memory. Now, most of our memories maybe are happy, but I'm sure there's a lot of us that have some pretty sad memories that cause us to weep and bring maybe pain, emotional pain, into our lives. But memories also are very practical. If we didn't remember that a red light means stop, and I think I'm seeing a few people forget that, that a stop sign means stop. I'll never forget being in court one day with somebody for something, and the judge was doing all these traffic violations, and the one guy didn't stop for a stop sign, got a ticket, and had to come to court, and the 
judge said, would you spell stop for me? <laughs> and he made him spell, spell stop, S-T-O-P. Then he said, now what do you think stop means? <laughs> and he made him spell it out. So some people either ignore it or they forget, but I can tell you, memories can be practical, amen? For instance, if you don't remember what day you got married, your anniversary day, you might be in trouble. Or maybe a birthday date for somebody that's in your life, you might be in trouble. So memories are practical. Now, sometimes, though, memories fail us. And one of the saddest things, of course, is dementia or even Alzheimer's these days. My wife's mother and my dad both died of dementia and Alzheimer's. And uh, it was really sad to see them go through that process, especially Edith's mother, who literally lost the memory of everything. And she thought Edith was her nurse. And before she passed away, she had no idea who any of us were. And so that, that's, that's sad as we think about that. So sometimes, though, even we tend to forget. And, and there are some things that we are supposed to forget. The Bible says forgetting those things which are behind. We reach forward to the things which are in front of us. So there's some things that, but honestly, 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 when it even comes to bad things, we don't always, we can't totally wipe them out of our mind. The only one person in the world that can totally forget something in the universe, you know who that is? God. <laughs> he said, I'll remember their sins no more. <laughs> Thank God for that. Amen. That's awesome, man. But we, we sometimes, the devil drags up an old memory of a sin in the past and, uh, and, and uses it to hinder us and, and to cause us problems with that. So there are some events, though, that we should never forget. And, and I believe Memorial Day commemorates some of them. This special day actually started at the end of the Civil War. And originally, anybody remember what it was called? Pardon? That's second. It was called Decorations Day. And so a mother whose son was killed in the Civil War from the South said started putting flowers on her son's grave and encouraged others to take flowers to the cemetery on uh, this special day to remember their fallen sons in battle in the Civil War. And then it kind of spread and was called uh, Decoration Day, then Remembrance Day. And uh, then after World War I, it became a national holiday dedicated to remember those who made the ultimate sacrifice for the freedoms that we enjoy today. And so actually, many of us, like my wife and I, this week while we were back in Roanoke, we went to the cemetery and took a few minutes to walk by her parents' graves, to walk my by my parents' graves, they're buried in the same cemetery, fortunately, all outside Roanoke, Virginia, at Mill Creek Church, uh, there in, in the, near what's called Buchanan, Troutville, Fincastle. I'm not sure what you call that area out there, Mill Creek area, really. And so, so we, we take that day to go maybe to a cemetery and remember even our loved ones or that week to take time to do that, and I think we should. As a matter of fact, I took pictures of my parents' uh, uh, stones and uh, sent them to all my siblings because I, we need to remember and uh, the legacy and the wonderful parents that we had to raise us and give us such a great, great, great legacy. Now, in the Bible, the word remember is used over 148 times, 148 times. And most of the time, God is telling his people not to forget but to remember something, such as Psalm 106, verse 7. Our fathers, when they were in Egypt, did not consider your wondrous works. They did not remember the abundance of your steadfast love, but rebelled by the sea at the Red Sea. But soon they forgot his works. They did not wait for his counsel. In verse 13 and verse 21, they forgot God, their Savior, who had done great things things in Egypt. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, you almost have a whole chapter uh, given, it's a long chapter given to telling the people to remember what God did for them in delivering them out of Egypt and providing for them lest they forget, 
lest they forget. And we won't go through all those verses. In Psalm 143, verses 4 through 6, the psalmist said, Therefore my spirit faints within me. My heart within me is appalled. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all that you've done. I ponder the work of your hands. I stretch out my hands to you. My soul thirsts for you like a parched land. And so the psalmist was saying when his spirit fainted, his heart was failing him, he was discouraged. Maybe he was going into a depression. He's just down. What did he do? He said, I remembered God. I remembered his mighty works. I remembered the good things that the Lord had done for me in the past. Because I can tell you, the devil can get on your shoulder and sure cause you to get really discouraged and even maybe go into a depression. And so there are special days and times in the Bible that were designed to help us remember specific events. And we're going to be talking about those today. And actually, this first one is found in Joshua chapter 4 here, where God told Joshua to take these 12 memorial stones, as we've already talked about, out of the river and set them up. Matter of fact, if you read on through the chapter... He actually had an, another 12 stone memorial. Did anybody see that too while you were looking at that? Where did they set up those 12 stones? Yeah, somebody said in the middle of the river. And so he had them take 12 stones and put them in the river. Now, interesting, on flood time, the Jordan River can really get wide, okay? And that was when they were crossing. And, uh, but during uh, the dry season, that river looks like a creek. I can tell you it's not as big as Cape Fear River that we cross coming over here. It's just like a creek, and it's very shallow. And so you can imagine ever so many months that those pile of stones would show up in the middle of the river. And you go, where did that come from? And it's obvious the way they were stacked that they came to, somebody put them there. And again, it was a remembrance how God dried up that Jordan River, and they crossed the went across on dry land. Now, mo the, these occasions ought to remind us in these stones that we set up in our lives of God's greatness, God's faithfulness, God's love, God's grace, God's forgiveness, God's mercy, God's power, and God's presence in our lives. Amen? So we need memorials. We need memorials. And uh, that we can set up in our lives that cause us to remember. And so I want to give you it, probably more than 12. But, but, and we're not going to be here all day. I promise you that, okay? But 12 stones that you ought to set up in your life as a memorial to remind you of what the Lord has done for you. The first one I want to set up is our spiritual birthday. Our spiritual birthday. Now, we actually have a scripture passage for this, Exodus chapter 12, verse 14. The people of Israel get ready to come out of Egypt. God has had nine plagues that he's poured out on the people of Egypt, not the Israelites. And now the tenth plague's about to take place, and it's called the death of the firstborn. And you remember what they were told to do if they wanted the firstborn in their family to live. They had to kill a little lamb that had been set apart that was without blemish. And they took the blood of that lamb after they killed it and they sprinkled it on the doorpost and on the lintel across the top. Now always that's interesting to me because if you look at that, that makes a symbol of the cross even there in the book of Exodus. And if the blood was on the doorpost and the lintel, when the death angel passed over that night, when he saw the blood, because the blood was applied and the people believed, the firstborn in that family did not have to die. Amazing. It became a picture of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who was spotless and stainless and sinless, alone who could die on a cross in my place for my sins, pay the ultimate sacrifice so that I could be saved, and he becomes our Passover lamb. 
our Passover lamb. And matter of fact, Jesus was crucified at what time? The Passover time. And so they then, and here's what he said, this day shall be for you a memorial day. You shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. As a statute forever, forever, you shall keep it as a feast. And so one of the last things the Lord did with his disciples before he went to Gethsemane and went to the cross, he observed this feast with his 12 disciples, the Passover. And then he went and actually he even said, I am basically fulfilling what you have been looking at for these several thousand years before the cross of Christ after the Passover in Exodus chapter 12. So this represents your spiritual birthday. Your spiritual birthday. Do you remember the day that you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior? So I, I visited, when I go back to Roanoke, we have all these dear widow ladies and have older people, friends that are dying cancer and they're dear dear friends so I always go by and try to visit with them but, and I know they're going to ask that I preach their funerals and so I kind of refresh my mind by always asking now tell me about when you got saved <laughs> tell me when that was in your life and I love hearing their stories oh, if I've already heard it I want to hear it again because I don't always have the best memory and then it gets kind of confusing with a lot of people telling you a lot of stories which story goes with which person if you don't write it down? And so, as I heard those stories even this week, it just blessed my heart. But you need a spiritual birthday. My spiritual birthday, everybody in my other churches knew it better than I think I knew it. February 21st, 1971, about 4 o'clock in the afternoon in a house on the church property, I was with the associate pastor who was a son of the senior pastor of the church, Dr. Harold Rollins. And that's the place I opened up my heart and received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and everything, everything changed. I found forgiveness of sins. I, I'm telling you, I found life. My eyes were open for the first time I could see. The darkness that hung over me was gone. I never want to forget February 21st, 1971. That's my spiritual birthday. Do you have that memorial in your life? And you know, every time we take the Lord's Supper here at the church, and we take the cup, and we take the bread, and we drink of the cup, we're reminded of that day that Jesus died for us. It's a memorial to remind us of his death Till he comes. Another memorial could be your baptism day. Your baptism day. And I kind of connected to this to right after Passover, they come to the Red Sea. And they have to go through the Red Sea to get out of Egypt. Now, you don't have to be baptized to be saved. Hey, Amen. Thank God for that. But you should be baptized to get out of Egypt. <laughs> we got a whole lot of Egypt in us. And, and we, need to, we need to realize we're not of this world anymore. You're in the world, but you're not of the world. And baptism is a picture of the new life in Jesus Christ. And so 1 Corinthians 10, 1 and 2, For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud. They all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Wow. Baptized in the likeness of his death. Raised in the likeness of his resurrection. Amen. Have you been baptized since you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? That's a memorial. Now, for me, I had no family at that church. They had already moved to Lynchburg, Virginia. I was in Cincinnati, Ohio. I had all these friends that weren't very, very good friends that were in the church. They did things. We all did them together, and we were church kids. And 
And I knew they were going to be really shocked when I came back to church that night. It was a big, big church. Our youth department had like 300 teenagers. It was a big church. And I can remember going back to church that night, and I was determined I was going to get baptized that night. And lo and behold, they have about 10 pastors on staff, and there's one pastor on the staff that I particularly did not like or care for. I can't say I really hated him, but I didn't like him. And guess who was doing the baptism that night? <laughs> that pastor was. But it didn't matter to me. I got saved, and I wanted to be baptized and follow the Lord and make a public profession of my faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? Have you been baptized since you've been saved? That's a stone you can set up. And then another one I thought about was the day you really dedicated your life to the Lord. In, in two examples in the Bible, in Genesis chapter 28, it says, So early in the morning Jacob took the stone that he had put under his head, and he set it up for a pillar, poured oil on the top of it, and he called the name of that place Bethel. Now, Beth in Hebrew means house. E-L always means God. E-L. My name is Mike L. Michael. Michael. Mike L. And E-L in my name actually stands for God. Now, I can't live up to my name like I should because my name means, oh, God help me, he who is like God. Whew, I got a long way to go. And, uh, but he took up, he took a stone, made a pillar out of it, poured oil on it, called it Bethel. The name of that city was Luz at the first. And he made a vow. If God will be with me and will keep me in the way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I will come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone, which I have set up for a pillar, shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I'll give a full tent to you. And basically he was saying, even as I now give a tithe, and that word tenth means tithe, as I give a tithe to you, and as we give our tithes, it becomes a part of our memorial stone, remembering everything we have comes from God. So even as you give your tithes and offerings, it's a memorial. It's a reminder. You wouldn't have breath to breathe. breathe. You wouldn't have blood flowing through your veins and your heart beating if it wasn't for God, giving it to you every moment of every day. And so that's why I love to tithe, because I love the Lord, one, and I give to him because it's a constant reminder, anything I have came from God. Everything I have came from God. And so have you ever dedicated your life to the Lord? Have you ever dedicated your life to the Lord? In Joshua chapter 24, we have another example and I'm not going to read all these verses because we'd be here a long time. But Joshua, as he closes out the book of Joshua, is leaving final words with the people of Israel. And he says this, you need to choose this day whom you're going to serve. If God is God, serve him. If the idols of Canaan are going to be your God, serve them. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. And I'm just encouraging you. There ought to be a time in your life where you also say, Lord, here's my life. I give it to you totally, absolutely. And what it's called, I love what Andrew Murray calls it. He calls it absolute surrender. Absolute surrender. It's not just committing my life to Christ because you can take commitments back. When you surrender that means after that, it's not yours anymore. It's his. And I can tell you this, once you do that, God holds you accountable for that. But it's a good accountability because there's no life. Because Jesus said, you go ahead and try to save your life for yourself. Live how you want to live. Choose what you want to do with your life. Go the way you want to go. You know what's going to happen? You're going to lose your life. But if you will lose your life for my sake and the gospel's, Guess what? He said, you will find your life. 
You need to have a point where you dedicate yourself to the Lord. That's why Paul said, I beseech you, my brethren. He says in verse 1 of chapter 12, by the mercies of God, because you've experienced God's wonderful mercies of saving you from sin, saving you from hell. If you've experienced that, he said, I beseech you that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God. It's only your reasonable service. Amen? That's what it is. Have you ever set that stone up in your life? Have you ever made that choice? You'll never be sorry you did, I can tell you. I can tell you this, you'll be sorry if you don't because you're missing what the Christian life is all about. The day I did that was sometime in April or May of 1971, just a few months. I went forward in a service. Nobody prayed with me. Nobody talked to me. The missionary was the speaker that day. I'll never forget his message. I sat where they sat from Ezekiel. And that day, I went up front, and I was scared to death because I didn't like getting in front of people. I didn't know what it might mean. I thought that night it meant I was going to go to Africa as a missionary. I really did. But I was willing to go wherever God would send me. And I've had a 50 years. That was over, what, 1971? You figured it out, okay, 53 years ago. I, I mean, I have been on the most amazing journey. I could ever, I could have never imagined how good God's been to me and the life I've been able to live and what God has done. You'll never be sorry. Amen? Okay, we got 10, 10, 12 more to go. No, I'm sorry, not that many. Now, now, along with that, and I've got this next one real close to it, okay? And that's your commitment to separation. Your commitment to separation. And this is part of that surrender to the Lord. But in Proverbs 22, verse 28, do not remove the ancient landmark that your fathers have set. Okay, and, and I think this is important. That's part of not being conformed to this world after you present your bodies a living sacrifice. But what does he say? Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God and what is the good and acceptable perfect will of God. You need a stone set up in your life where you said, you know, things I used to do, I'm not going to do anymore. Because now instead of using that time to serve myself to do things, I'm not going to do that anymore. At one time, I loved ball. I loved ball. Man, I loved playing ball. Man, it was like my DNA. It was in my bones to play ball, you know? So high school, played baseball my senior year. Goodness, I made the big teams in all state, and I was lead. I mean, it was good. I thought I was going to be a pro baseball player, but that was just th wishful thinking, to be honest with you. And, uh, but, but I loved ball. So when I got saved, I got on the church softball team, and I got pretty good. With them. And man, we, nobody could beat us, I can tell you that. When I became a pastor, I stayed on the church softball team at the church I became a pastor. And I can remember Sunday afternoons, we were starting to play in tournaments and nobody could beat us. And, and, and I would go to the tournament and I'd run to church on Sunday night thinking of the message I was going to preach and changing clothes so I could get up in the pulpit and preach Sunday night. But one day God says, I think baseball, softball's too much a part of your life. And I can remember everybody saying, you can't quit softball, man. You play second base. You, you can't quit. And I'm going, you can just be a substitute. But I couldn't be a substitute. Because <laughs> if I was going to be a substitute, I was going to be playing anyway. So I just walked away from it. But it was, a, it was a stone that I was able to set up and say, and over the years, God might take another one and just say, hey, it's okay for everybody else to do that. Don't be critical of them. But at this point, you need to take another step of separation. That's another whole message. Number five, your commitment to your family. I wish we had time to read these verses in Exodus chapter 28, 9 through 12. But the priest was to take the names of the 12 tribes of Israel, put them in stones on his breastplate, and bear them before the Lord on his two shoulders for remembrance. Now here's what I ask you to do with this one. You need to set up a time and place where you pray for your family every day. Every day. We were taught to pray by Jesus, give us this day our daily bread. Not give us tomorrow, 
Give us next week, next year, or give us for the whole year, Lord. Now, we can dedicate a year to the Lord, but, 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 but we need daily say, God, protect my family. Cover my family with your blood. Avenge me of the adversary in my family today. Number six, your commitment to the word of God. Another great passage of scripture, Deuteronomy 27, 4 through 10. God told Moses to take these uncut stones and make an altar. And then he also said in verse 8, You shall write on the stones all the words of this law very plainly upon this stone. Keep and hear, O Israel, this day you have become the people of the Lord your God. Therefore shall you obey the voice of the Lord your God, keeping his commandments and his statutes, which I command you this day. You need to have a deep down commitment to God's word. I have somebody trying to tell me, well, you can't be sure that all the Bible is the word of God. And if you think about this, it means this, it means that. But I, I, I don't even have time to almost talk about that with this individual simply because I have already nailed in stone that I believe these 66 books in this book right here are the holy word of God. I've got a stone set up I'm not going to move from. It's his word. Amen? Then, then these are a little bit peripheral maybe, but maybe you're experienced with God for a, spirit, a, a, a special miracle. Like Joshua when he crossed the Jordan River. I mean, it's a miracle. And so you can set those times up and tell your children about them in years to come. Or maybe have a picture on the wall and say, hey, look at that, look at that car. It's, it's not, there's nothing left to it. I was in that car. I should be dead. God, save me. Amen? And so things like that that you can use to transfer to the next generation God's miraculous deliverance for you. And the same thing in 1 Samuel chapter 7. The Philistines had attacked the nation of Israel. Okay? But then God thundered a mighty sound that day against the Philistines, threw them in confusion. And Samuel in verse 12 took a stone, set it up between Mizpah and Shin, and called its name Ebenezer, for he said, till now the Lord has helped us. So there was a stone that people would go by and say, what's that mean? And they'd say, Ebenezer. <laughs> it's a matter of fact, have you ever seen the name Ebenezer on a church? Of course you have. There's Ebenezer Methodist Church, Baptist Church. They're everywhere. They're called Ebenezer. And basically it's a stone that's set up and saying, the Lord hitherto has helped us. He's brought us through. We defeated the enemy. And you need some stones like that set up in your life. God's victory over a specific sin or situation in your life or a harmful habit. My dear friend that's dying, Roger, and I say dying, his wife, she has pancreatic cancer. They're telling him he's been fighting leukemia for years, Roger Reynolds. He, uh, he's now being tested for bladder cancer. And up in their 80s, and they're really dear friends. We was with them this week in their home for a long time. And, uh, but I'll never forget. <laughs> One day, Roger came to me and said, Pastor, he said, he said, he said, man, I, all my life, I've, he's an old railroad guy. He said, I chew tobacco. I chew tobacco. And I know I'm, I'm a, and, and you know what happened? He was buying some tobacco in the little local store right down around the corner from me. And the associate pastor happened to walk in the store with that tobacco laying on the counter behind him and watched him buy it. He turned around and saw the associate pastor. He goes, oh, goodness. And it embarrassed him. So he came to my office. It, it came to my office. He said, pastor, that's it. No more chewing tobacco for me. And he made a decision. He said, hold me accountable. You know, that's about 10 years ago. And I can tell you, he never, ever chewed another bunch of yucky chewing tobacco. I can't imagine even doing it in the first place. But, but some guys, it's the deal, huh? But anyway, so God's victory, and he, today he loves to tell that story that it's no more there. Amen? So every Sunday, he'd come in. I'd say, how you doing, Roger? He'd say, awesome, man. God's helped me another week. You need to set those stones up. Okay, another stone. Do you have a life verse? A verse that God uses in the scripture just to be there for you 
any time in your life. When I was a brand new Christian, I picked Philippians 1.6, being confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you, he'll perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. That's my life verse. All right? Do you have a verse like that? How about the first time sharing your public testimony? Okay? I'll never forget. You have to understand, I, I can't get in front of people. And, and, and so here I am, brand new Christian. My dad takes me to a friend's church of his in Cincinnati called, uh, I forgot, Deer Park Baptist Church. And the pastor, Tommy Trammell, I thought he was pretty old back then. And I noticed on Facebook, he's still alive <laughs> the other day. But in that church, I shared my very first public testimony. Stood up and said, I got saved. And let me tell you what Jesus means to me. How about the first time you teach a Bible lesson? It happened to be in that same big church with all these kids, and I got asked to teach a Sunday morning Sunday school lesson in the youth department. Wow, was I ever scared, but I'll never forget it. But it reminds me again, God helped me then, he'll help me again. My first time to preach on the street. <laughs> it was it, it, Remember the yippie year? Anybody remember the hippies and the yippies and all these people, the Jesus people and all that stuff? Back in the late 60s, early 70s, well, I just got saved, and, man, they were all over Cincinnati. And, uh, and so I got, I actually got up on a box in downtown Cincinnati Park and just stood up and started preaching to all these people walking around. <laughs> I had a group with me from church. But I'll never forget how scared I was, but we preached Jesus. How about your first soul that you won to Jesus? There, there's so many stones that you can set up. Maybe a wake-up day. Maybe a day that God just woke you up. And maybe it was because of a tragedy or heartbreak. Something happened. I'll never forget the guy calling me saying, and I tried to lead him to the Lord. I tried to... Get him right with God. His wife was coming to church. He wouldn't come. He did come, wouldn't come. Oh, Ray. And one day he called me. He said, Pastor, 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 she's gone. She's gone. She left me a letter and he read it to me. She's never coming back. She packed her clothes. I said, well, sounds like you're ready to get saved. <laughs> and he did. He got born again. They did get back together. They had two children. Goodness, they're grandparents now, even. And, and uh, so I'm telling you, maybe it's a wake-up day. God uses something just to wake you up to get your attention. Now, let me give you one last stone, and we're done. And that is the greatest and dearest memorial stone is Jesus himself. Amen? Jesus himself. Psalm 118, open to me the gates of righteousness and I'll go in through them and I'll praise the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous shall enter. I will praise you for you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone. Isaiah 28, 16, Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I'm the one who has laid as a foundation in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone of a sure foundation, and whoever believes will not be in haste. Jesus is that stone. Acts 4, 12, <laughs> Peter was preaching and he said, this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And then 1 Peter chapter 2 goes on to tell us again now how we have become living stones. In verse 6, for it stands in the scripture, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but to those who have not believed, the stone that the builders rejected has become the stoner cornerstone, but it's become a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Oh, my friend today, he will either become a stumbling block if you don't believe and put your faith and trust in him, 
or he'll become the foundation for your life. And you'll never, ever be sorry. Do you have Jesus set up as the memorial cornerstone of your life? May God help us to do that. Amen? Let's pray. So, Father, we thank you again for the word of God. Thank you for this precious group of people that are growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ every day. Lord, as we talked about in Sunday school, we go through this transition of a new pastor coming, leading us, Lord, and leading this church to accomplish your will and your mission in this Burgall community and even around the world. We are so excited. But Lord, help us not to forget. Help us not forget your goodness, your mercy, your salvation, and truly help us always keep Jesus Christ at the center as the cornerstone of everything we do, not only in our lives, but in everything we do as believers and uh, in our church. And so, Lord, I pray, speak to someone right now. Maybe you're listening by way of the website or Facebook, or maybe you're sitting here today and you don't know for a fact that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. You can't recall a time that Jesus came into your heart, forgave you of your sins. Could I invite you to give your heart to Jesus right now? God loved you so much that he sent his son, Jesus, to die in your place for your sins. And God proved that that love was genuine and powerful because on the third day, Jesus came out of that grave alive. He is a living Savior. He's not still on the cross. He's not still in the grave. He's alive. He's seated at the right hand of the Father, and all who call on his name can and could be saved, born again. If you've never done that, right now, where you're sitting, just like I did when I was 19 years old, you can invite Jesus to come in your heart. Would you do that right now? Would you pray from your heart, dear God, I know that I'm a sinner. I need a date. I need a time. I need a place, just like right now to know that you are my Savior. Forgive me for my sins. Come into my heart. Save me right now. In Jesus' name I pray. If you prayed that from your heart and you meant it with all your heart, just before we close, I'm not going to ask you to come forward. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. But if you don't mind, would you just look up at me and catch my eye? And you say, Preacher, I prayed that prayer with you and I meant it with all my heart. Is anyone like that? You not, don't know about your salvation, but you'd say today, God spoke to me. And Father in heaven, I thank you that you're always at work. Your word never comes or returns void. And I just pray again, you'll bless your word today. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, amen. Amen. God bless you. Take time to remember those who gave their lives for our country, especially sometime tomorrow. God bless.